I'll turn it over to you, Director. Thank you, Director. Thank you, Director. Thank you, David. Uh, I was just going to sit at the table, but my esteemed colleague said he's going to come to the mic, so I guess I'll go to the mic as well. Um, I'm going to talk about just kind of what our experience has been in Montana. Um, some of the issues that I'll hit on are, are already been talked about a little bit here as far as it relates to states and the differences between states and how you deal with that. But what I want to talk about is just kind of the concept that we've had in Montana. I'm going to talk about four species in particular, but you know, just to lead that off, I'd say the Endangered Species Act has been constructed and identifying species that are in decline and they're just as threatened to the future. Uh, it does appear as in the states, though, that there's been a lot more effort in toward listing the species as opposed to delisting. And I have to say, in a couple of meetings that I've been in recently, um, when we met with Fish and Wildlife Service folks, a lot of the folks identify themselves as listing biologists, but I can't say I've really, ever heard anybody say they're a delisting biologist. So that's a concern to us. It seems like it takes a long time to move through the recovery boat and to get them out there. So there have been some successes in Montana, and I'll talk about a couple of your successes. Um, but I would have to say they went through a long and tedious route. I mean, we're talking about a lot of years to get there. So the four species I want to talk about is the Arctic Grayling, the Wolverine, Gray Wolves, and Grizzly Bears. The first two aren't here as controversial as the last two, but I think they're important. Arctic Grayling were petitioned for listing under the ESA back in the 1990s, I think about 1991. And they were considered at that time warranted for listing, but precluded due to other priorities. So it became a huge issue for us in the state, and particularly that in the Big Hole Valley, it was the last remaining remnants of, remnants of that population. And there was great concern that you know, with endangered species listing, it could have severe impacts on that valley and the ranchers are in that valley in particular. So there was a major effort put together by uh, several partners, including Montana Fish and Wildlife Parks, the Natural Resource Conservation Service, the Fish and Wildlife Services Partners Program, as somebody mentioned before, the, the Nature Conservancy, the Big Hole Waterhead, Big Hole Watershed Committee all took on this as an ending as a significant threat and went to work very diligently to find a solution to that. Ultimately, what was done is we put together a pretty substantial candidate conservation agreement with assurances that covered, it was a blanket one that the Department of Fish, Wildlife, and Parks just basically oversees that and was signing with us in that. But everybody agreed to come into that. And the result of that is, is that there's a substantial amount more water that flows in the river each year. And that was a major part of the issue, is a big part of the Big Hole Valley is flood here, flood here game. So all that water is diverted out there, it just wasn't the water there. But understand that there are long-held water rights way back into the 1800s for that valley. So those are water rights that they had the right to do that. So without voluntary participation to shut that off, we would have still had the same problem we had today. But the irrigation practices have improved. Um, with a lot of efforts, the NRC has to put a little money into it, several other entities put money into it, and we're seeing major success with that. Uh, grazing practices improved, the riparian areas improved, and the numbers of grayling have both expanded, and then we're also seeing a lot more in the river itself. Ultimately, the decision came about that it was a not warranted decision. It came up uh, almost a year ago now, it was in 2014 in the fall. And we thought that was a significant effort, but it shows what a true partnership would be. Well, one of the things that's a little different than this than other ones is that this was a single state involved and actually a single river valley. So it was more easy to get everybody directly involved. Whereas we're talking about, and John Harger talks specifically about, when you talk about multiple states involved, it gets even more difficult to deal with the situation. But it was focused on one watershed. The second species I want to talk about was Wolverine. Um, in 2013, there was a rule that was put out by the Fish and Wildlife Service to list the Wolverine. Uh, as a threat species, and the primary factor that was listed at that time was the lack of high elevation snowpack that's predicted to be there in the future because of climate change. So they're saying 30 to 40 years from now, that amount of snow is going to be significantly different, and that's significant to Wolverine. So that was a significant issue that was out there. Montana and Idaho probably have the strongholds of Wolverine that are out there. And actually, we had major concerns to start with because Wolverine have been actually increasing, and we can clearly document that over the last 15, 20 years. So we're looking at a listing of the species that's actually increasing, but because of concerns going into the future that were with science that we had some questions about, we had major concerns. But I have to give the Fish and Wildlife Service credit in this case that they listened to the perspectives. There were nine states that actually got involved with this because of those that 
that there may be some uh, Wolverine action and then some of those that could be expanding into. And so we asked the service to take a second look at that. They did re reconvene a panel of several experts. They spent quite a little time looking at that. And ultimately, the decision was made that the science was not clearly there, that that was going to be a significant impact of Wolverine. And they made a decision that it was not warranted for listing in that case as well. Now, both of those have been a success. But I do have to say that both of those are now in litigation. Um, various uh, conservation environmental groups have now sued. In those cases, the states that were involved, particularly Montana and Idaho, you know, intervene. So we're in this with the service are particularly directly on this because we believe they made the right decision in this case. The third third species I'm going to talk about is the gray wolf. And the gray wolf was highly controversial from the very beginning. And it's primarily I'm going to talk about the three states here. I'm not going to talk about the Midwestern, the Great Lake states, because that's kind of out of our realm. But if you look at that, um, in Montana's case, we're in a different situation than Idaho and Wyoming because we had wolves that were naturally immigrating in from Canada way back into the late 70s, and in the 80s, they actually established some packs. Those wolves came with an endangered species list. So they had the full protection of the Endangered Species Act, which was basically hands off. It was a decision that was made by the Department of Interior to actually put more wolves in, to reintroduce wolves in the Yellowstone Park in central Idaho in the mid-90s. And so those two populations were put in place basically under a non-essential experimental classification. Those populations expanded very rapidly, as did ours from the Northwest. And one of the complications that came from that right off the bat was is it didn't take long that we had wolves that were intermingling from either side of that. And we had the, the arbitrary line between the non-essential experimental and danger was the interstate highway. On one side of the highway, a rancher had the ability to take a wolf that he was in the middle of their livestock because he was spending his livestock on a non-essential experimental. If that wolf crossed the highway, you couldn't touch it. Well, what does that do with a rancher who owns property on both sides of that highway? And you don't lose in the middle of that issue, but us. So it made it really very really difficult to try and deal with that situation. The other situation that occurred is that the wolves were actually considered recovered in the Northern Rocky Mountains by the commitments that were made by the states for um, 10 breeding packs and 100 wolves in each state. That was met in 2002. Uh, Montana and Idaho had, had plans that were approved in 2004. Um, but with Wyoming, the Fish and Wildlife Service could not come to agreement on a plan. So the investing rule was not forwarded until 2009, and at that time, then it was overruled. But what happened in that time frame is that if you look at back at that 2004, I think Montana and Idaho were looking at somewhere about 200, 200 to 300 wolves. Well above the recovery goal that was required. Well, by 2009, our populations were 650 to 700. And we were having a lot more depredation problems and issues that were out there, but we really couldn't do much with that. But it kind of falls back to where John Hart just talked about the issue between states. Uh, Montana and Idaho kind of felt we're being held hostage here, you know, not because of anything we had to do, but because of the service would not agree with what Wyoming wanted to do. And we had to fully respect that the politics and everything else are different in Wyoming. You know, to add to that effect, um, I was director from 2001 to 2008, and I was out for a short time. But I can tell you that everybody was majorly concerned in the safe drops now because Montana up until 2013 said, we're not doing anything. We got calls from several of my counterparts in other states, as well as the Fish and Wildlife Service that said, you know, Montana, if you don't get on board, because we were considered to be number two as far as population of birds, number two as far as habitat available. If you don't get on board, it's very likely that they're going to be listed and all those other states are going to pay for it because Montana won't come forward. We have a similar situation is likely developing with bull trout. Um, Dustin may speak a little bit about dust, bull trout as well. The bull trout are in several states, um, from Montana going westward. And it may be the case that they're a very viable population in some of those states, but not in all the states. I'm getting down to a quick wrap up here and getting to grizzly bears. Um, grizzly bears, Montana's a little different situation. Grizzly bears, most of the talk here has been about the great Yellowstone ecosystem. Uh, that's only a small part of what Montana has for grizzly bears. Um, the population of Yellowstone is 750 to 1,000 bears. In the non continental divide ecosystem, we have somewhere between 1,100 and 1,200 bears. But we can't move forward with delisting on the northern continental divide ecosystem until the greater Yellowstone is done. Um, those of you that are familiar with that, it was a delisting rule that was published in 2007, but it was overruled by the courts and pulled back largely because of the issue of the white bark pine. 
Um, we are now back. We've been in discussions now, Scott, for what Scott less than about three years now to try and get back. And we have felt that the bar has been raised for us. With several of the conditions that were required for us originally, they seem to be higher now. And that made it difficult for the state. And some of them are actually contradictory to what we felt from what was in that 2007. So we're concerned about how that's moving forward. We're hopeful we can move it forward. But as was said earlier, uh, prison bears were listed in 1975. Here we are now, how many years later? Um, we have, the states have worked very diligently, spent a lot of money on prison bear recovery. Like I said, in Montana's case, we've spent that actually. We have four designated populations for grizzly bears. And one of the main concerns because of this, there was a ruling that occurred just recently, I think somebody referred to the one of wolves in Minnesota, 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 Wisconsin, and then in Michigan, in regard to that it said, a species that is listed as a whole cannot be delisted as a DPS at the state population segment. Well, here, Montana, we're looking at four populations of grizzly bears. Two of them are well past recovery. The Greater Yellowstone, and then also the Northern Colorado Divide ecosystem. But in the Cabin Yak ecosystem and the Bitter ecosystem, quite frankly, from our perspective, from our biologists to the state, we will never need to recover those. So if delisting is going to be based on the total population, we're all in trouble. These, these are never going to get delisted because we, we just simply cannot see those other populations becoming um, meeting that criteria. But the last thing I want to wrap up, and I, I spoke about it just very briefly there. Was about the specter, I guess I call it the specter of the threat for climate change. I mean, that's a major concern to us. And I know Alaska, Bruce Dales here in the audience, Alaska has a situation where a species have been listed there based on the forecast of what's happening with the Arctic ice pack. And then those populations are very high. And the biggest question becomes what do we do for something that they're very likely we're not going to have any control of? How do we develop a recovery plan? If we're going to talk about Wolverine. I don't think it's realistic that we're going to buy enough snow machines to keep snow in those high elevation pairs. So it becomes an issue if that truly is a factor. How do we deal with that? And I think the Fish and Wildlife Service would say that, you know, when the Endangered Species Act was back in 1973, it's very likely that climate change was not part of the factors they were looking at as being one that's a major threat to species in the future. The last comment I wanted to make was along the line of other people made is that we think it's extremely important that we recognize that, like I said, in the piece of Wolverine, that the Fish and Wildlife Service recognized the state's expertise, and we all sat down and talked about that before an actual listing occurred, and that hopefully we can do that in the future. And part of the new rules that we're talking about prior to listing will help along that line. So, with that, I'll wrap it up. Thank you. And Jeff, you kind of uh, <clears throat> set the mold there. We did uh, discuss, you know, sitting up here as, as a panel, and, and you listened to your colleague Scott, and so I guess we're all going to have to be up here <laughs> in front of the microphone, in front of the podium, and I have to obviously uh, uh, turn it down a little bit more. So these two gentlemen. Um, anyways, well, thank you for uh, for uh, hosting this, uh, Governor Mead and, and your staff, and WGA for. Uh, Providing the, uh, the, the the meeting space and dealing with all the logistics for putting this very important important conference uh, together. Uh, my name is Dustin Miller. I'm the administrator for Governor Otter's Office of Species Conservation, located in Boise, Idaho. Um, you know what our agency does is is, is really focus on the, uh, the coordination and the implementation of policies and programs geared towards the recovery and delisting of species that are protected. One of the endangered species act. We also focus on candidate species as well as rare and declining species, and we do this work in conjunction with our, uh, our our local state agency partners, primarily the Idaho Department of Fish and Game. And uh, Director Virgil Moore is not here today, but he works very closely with uh, with both these two gentlemen on uh, all sorts of issues, as, as Jeff um, discussed earlier. Um, and so my job is really to help. Director Moore and his team out on uh, dealing with the ESA policy implications, the challenging issues, uh, while they work very uh, um, uh, closely on the science and the technical data. And uh, it's a really good relationship that we have. And I know Virgil and I joke that we uh, really provide each other a, a lot of backup. And uh, so anyways, that's kind of the story of, of who I am and, and, and what we do. 
And the focus of the panel is is on uh, recovery and delisting. And uh, you know, one of our big focuses in in Idaho is uh, um, on recovery planning efforts. Um, you know, obviously, fish and wildlife populations fare much better under state management than they do under federal management. And so, uh, to the maximum extent we can, we are involved at every step of the way uh, in the recovery planning process. It's our state agency biologists and technical personnel and scientists that have that technical expertise and that background and the know-how of what species need and what their their habitat requirements are to really make those uh, educated and informed decisions on how to move forward to conserve, recover, and ultimately delist species um, in Idaho with considering the economic implications of what those conservation actions uh, really uh, really need on the ground. And, um, you know, it's really has to be the states in the driver's seat in a lot of these discussions on re recovery planning. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's frustrating when we go through processes um, like bull trout, for example, in Idaho. Bull trout have been listed for a number of years, since 1998. A recovery plan was just recently released this year, along with a recovery unit implementation plan. So, as, uh, as, as Jeff indicated, bull trout were listed, you know, population-wide, but they split up these, the, the population into recovery units. And now we are moving forward with Fish and Wildlife Service on implementing these recovery units implementation plans. But it's been multiple years since bull trout were listed. Um, that issue has been in and out of the courts for a number of years. Critical habitat was designated uh, for the second time in 2010. And um, the frustrating thing is that it's taken so long to get a recovery plan out. Um, and so what I would like to focus on, one of the changes I would like to see, and I think the state of Idaho would, for that matter, with the uh, Endangered Species Act focused on the recovery planning part, is having the states play a more dominant role in that recovery planning effort, being in the driver's seat. Again, the states have the technical expertise and the background to lead these discussions. They know what our fish and wildlife populations need and, again, what their habitat requirements are. So the focus really should be on having the state drive the uh, the bus on these re recovery planning processes. Obviously, with federal involvement as well as stakeholder involvement from our NGOs to our uh, our industry partners, conservation organizations, sportsmen groups, it is imperative that the state play a dominant role. I would like to see the Endangered Species Act um, also set a timeline for the development of a recovery plan. Again, with the bull trout example. I mean, we were 16, 18 years um, when, since bull trout were, uh, were, were officially listed. It's really unacceptable that we have to wait that long to have a recovery plan. Now we have to implement on the ground when we've been spending all kinds of money and resources uh, over the last 16, 18 years to recover that species already. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense that that recovery plan has got to lag so far behind. Um, you know, other examples were, were, were mentioned on, on wolves and wolf delisting, and everybody knows that whole roller coaster ride in the Northern Rockies of, uh, of wolf recovery. Um, our, our objectives were met, you know, 10 years prior to, um, you know, Congress jumping in and actually officially delisting wolves. And that's an unfortunate reality, too, because it's in that circumstance the ESA failed. And, uh, we had to have Congress jump in and, and legislatively make a decision to do this rules. Uh, the ESA was not allowed to play out how it was intended to play out and what the original intent of Congress was. And so, I'm getting my, my five minute card here. Um, and so really, to get down to it, states need to be in the driver's seat on recovery planning. It's the states that have the expertise and the ability to develop these partnerships and maintain these partnerships and build the trust with our local communities, our NGOs, our folks in the, uh, in, in the uh, ag community, the energy sector, and they're able to build that trust and bring people along to ensure that we are providing what we need to and doing what we need to do from a recovery planning standpoint for the species and its habitat while maintaining the economic vitality uh, of our states. It's, it's imperative that we, we have that shift and we allow the states to play a more dominant role in, uh, in that regard. Um, 
I guess with that, I've already received my uh, my five minutes uh, uh, my five minute warning. But um, looking forward to having more dialogue with you all and, and having further conversations. Thank you. What's that? Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Scott Todd, and I'm the director of the Wyoming Cayman Fish Department. And it's certainly a pleasure to be with you here today. Uh, certainly, thanks to David and Nephi and, and the governor for uh, convening this workshop and giving us all the opportunity to, to discuss some of these uh, most important issues to our future. I certainly think that the governor did an, an excellent job this morning in uh, paraphrasing and, and setting the stage for. Uh, endangered species issues in the state of Wyoming. And I guess I'd just like to uh, follow that up. Wyoming is a state that has a culture of wildlife, and uh, uh, we rank um, either number one, two, or three in hunting, fishing, and wildlife, uh, outdoor recreation in the nation. Um, if you go to restaurants, if you go to our homes, if you go to our schools, um, either wildlife or taxidermy mounts or hunting and fishing uh, identify who we are in the state of Wyoming. Uh, a recent survey conducted in Wyoming indicated that 74% of the people in the state of Wyoming feel that the presence of wildlife in their life enhances their quality of life in the state. So uh, uh, wildlife is very important to us. And while we have a reputation of being a hook and bullet state, uh, we like to hunt, we like to fish, we like to do those things. I think that if you look uh, beyond that, and you look at uh, the culture of wildlife, uh, Wyoming statute requires the Wyoming Game and Fish Department uh, to manage all wildlife in the state of Wyoming. And uh, if you step back and you look at the, uh, the listing of the per peregrine falcon, uh, Wyoming was one of the first states to uh, work on the reintroduction of peregrine falcon. Uh, I think if you look at the Black-Footed Ferret and our efforts on the Black-Footed Ferret, uh, the Wyoming toad and a, and a variety of other species, uh, our actions uh, as a state clearly demonstrate that uh, we're concerned about all wildlife in the state of Wyoming, even though we are a, a state that engages in the consumptive activities of wildlife. Um, <coughs> Representative, the Honorable Representative Summers this morning uh, made several comments that I'd like to follow up on. And, and one of the things that, that he mentioned is, is that Wyoming is a relationship state. And uh, let me assure you that if you want to accomplish anything in Wyoming, you need to uh, uh, bring everybody to the table and you need to establish those, those relationships in order to be successful. I think that you can see that very clearly. And, and the sage grouse work that um, uh, we started in the state of Wyoming and, and the way we went about that. Uh, several things that I would like to visit with you all about today, and, and certainly as, as we look at the Endangered Species Act, I think there's a couple important things. One would be the application of the act and, and consistency, and I'll try not to repeat some of the things that previous speakers have uh, mentioned, but if you look at uh, uh, let's just take a suite of species ranging from black-footed ferrets to lynx to grizzly bears, wolves, peregrine falcons, um, Wyoming toad. And you look at the way the act has been applied to all of those species, whether it be conservation strategies, whether it be environmental assessments, whether it be management plans, uh, the designation of a critical habitat. And uh, while I certainly support the flexibility of the act, um, I also look at, at the flexibility of those species, and then I look at species like the Louisiana black bear, and uh, what I term as future prescriptive management applied by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service that requires certain uh, post delisting uh, or, or certain elements in, in the, the delisting rule. And uh, uh, if, if you look at that for a very, very short period of time, you will see that the act is uh, administered, uh, should I say, extremely inconsistently, not only across species, but from state to state. And uh, while we as, as state managers need some flexibility, um, I, I also think that, that uh, some of the administration of the act 
uh, on a, shall I say, local or regional basis within the services created. So fairly significant revenues for the states. Um, I, I believe it was Commissioner Livingston uh, was asked a question this morning about the application or the, the changing goalposts. And there's been several folks that have uh, alluded to changing goalposts, and, and Jeff and I and, and uh, our colleague from Idaho, Virgil, have been working through uh, many of those issues recently. But I'll step back to the question that was asked to, to Commissioner Livingston about the changing goalposts on the wall. Uh, when wolves were introduced, uh, it was our impression that uh, uh, as the states, we would be responsible for 10, bear, 10 breeding pairs and 100 wolves in each of the individual states. That then changed to 15 and 150. In Wyoming, it then changed to uh, 10 breeding pairs and 100 wolves outside of Yellowstone National Park, uh, in addition to all of the uh, wolves that were in Yellowstone and the Winter of the Indian Reservation. Uh, further discussions were buffers around uh, Grand Teton National Park and, and Yellowstone National Park. So um, clearly, and um, Commissioner Livingston alluded to it, that that goal post change. And uh, as we worked through that, uh, it became more and more difficult for us. And, and um, uh, eventually, we did come up with a plan that was rejected by the courts. And I'd like to visit about that in a little in, in a moment. But uh, uh, switching very quickly to grizzly bears and where we're at with the recovery of grizzly bears and now we'll go into the changing goalposts there but one of the frustrations with grizzly bears to us has, has been uh, um, we uh, as a state have invested a significant amount of money in grizzly bears and uh, uh, while we're cha charged with the management of all wildlife uh, this is also a federally protected species, a federally listed species. Your Fish and Wildlife Service clearly calls all the shots and, and uh, Representative Summers, I think, painted a pretty good picture for all of you of what they are dealing with in the upper grain. But uh, I also have to, to remind you, I think he said that allotment was uh, between 150 and 200,000 acres. Uh, we have grizzly bears throughout all of northwest Wyoming and uh, certainly the North Fork and the South Fork. Uh, we have producers in Sunlight and Crandall. We have producers uh, uh, on the South Fork of the uh, uh, Shoshone River. We have uh, property owners all through those ecosystems. And, and um, I certainly appreciate the, the working relationship that we have with all of those folks. We have to realize that uh, those conflicts, whether they be anywhere from uh, bears in the backyards of uh, uh, rural subdivisions eating 4-H lands to uh, breaking into uh, granaries or in the case of the upper grain, significant cattle depredations. Uh, our folks work with a variety of publics on that. That program uh, this past year cost us right at $2.3 million. Uh, those are sportsman's dollars. Those are dollars that are allocated from license sales in the state of Wyoming for that species. Uh, last year in 2015 was the largest contribution that Wyoming has ever received from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service under Section 6 for grizzly bears, and that was $149,000. In uh, 2014, uh, we spent right at $1.9 million, and uh, the uh, contribution through Section 6 was $93,000. Uh, throughout my career, I have been uh, closely engaged in, in grizzly bear and damage issues in the state of Wyoming. Uh, the lowest that I recall our Section 6 contribution was about uh, $15,000 a year. So not only do you see the state stepping up to address uh, those conflicts and address uh, those concerns, you also see the state uh, uh, stepping up and uh, uh, financing those as well. I'm not sure that uh, I was ready for that, if I um, can step back a little bit. But, uh, uh, in, in trying to wrap this up, I think the funding is a huge issue. There needs to be uh, adequate funding, adequate federal funding for federal management of those species. I think that there needs to be consistency in the application of the act. And uh, uh, Jeff alluded to it earlier, but uh, uh, the Endangered Species Act clearly says that, that the service shall use the best available science. And uh, I think they do use the best available science for listing. 
I think they should also use the best available science for delisting species. And if you look at, once again, going back to the grids of Baron, I'm trying to talk as fast as I can. No more cards there. But, but uh, if you look at uh, where we were in the lawsuit on the uh, on habitat assessment for white bark pine, the states, Idaho, Wyoming, uh, Montana, and, and uh, partnership with USGS and, and the service published 13 peer reviewed papers. And, and during that time, while we were doing that, working forward with the listing, uh, the reason their population continued to grow and expand, conflicts in Wyoming continued to grow and expand, and those 13 scientific papers clearly demonstrated to us that grizzly bears are omnivores and they will find food on the landscape wherever that is. So there's a problem with the process. When you have uh, an animal like the grizzly bear that has exceeded all agreed upon recovery criteria for 12 years, and that animal is still listed. Uh, the states don't have management of that that uh, particular uh, species of animal. Uh, we need to uh, uh, move forward to make some changes there to ensure that uh, uh, the, the, the management of the states and, and I would throw out uh, that I would defy anyone in this room or anyone in this nation to demonstrate to me a species of animal that would extinct under state management. Um, certainly, if you look at our counterparts to the west uh, and north, Montana and Idaho, uh, their wolf management plans are far different than ours, and they continue to uh, uh, exceed all of the recovery criteria in those states as well. So, uh, uh, with that, uh, I'll go ahead and wrap this up, and um, if you have any questions, uh, I guess we'll get to that. Thank you. Thank you to our three panelists. We, we actually here have uh, a fair amount of time for what I would hope will be a, a robust discussion. Um, I'll, I'll lead it off, although uh, hopefully there'll be a number of questions that follow. Uh, but Jeff, you mentioned, uh, you touched on distinct population segments uh, when we talked about wolves, uh, in, I think, and, and grizzly bears, you mentioned this. Uh, the Western Lakes you know, DPS and that, that lawsuit and the impact it has for, for grizzly bears. Staying on that topic of DPS as in general, how should the state population segments be defined and utilized? Uh, when you look at, at recovery on a broad basis, like, like with wolves or grizzly bears, when you're looking at multiple states or sage grouse you know, to prevent those things, uh, it makes it difficult for individual states to accomplish recovery, and, and, and you touched on this, every state has different politics and, and, and different science. Uh, it, it may actually put the states at odds with one another. Uh, how do we, are, are there any ways we can overcome that issue uh, with respect to GPS, the state population settings? I don't know if I have a real clear, clean answer to that, but from a standpoint, I think, is that we do have to respect every state has its own politics, and, and John Harge talked about, you know, you have different things that go on, and one, fit, one, one size isn't going to fit all. So I think it needs to be looked at that there are differences between each of the states. And then the other part of it is that I think you need to definitely look at it local. I mean, Scott touched on it a little bit, is that we spend a lot of time convincing our constituencies in the state that this is a plan that needs to move forward. And it takes a lot of time to do that. And for us to turn around and have to retool our plan because it didn't fit with what somebody else said in another state should be makes it more difficult. I, I think that if we can get to somewhere that you're setting the standards of what the recovery goals are, like Scott said, you know, we talked about wolves, but the recovery standard was 100 breeding pairs, or excuse me, 10 breeding pairs and 100 wolves. If each of those three states have met that, and we continue in Montana and Idaho, we continue to do well over that now. Why should we? Why should Wyoming be held different when their their population is currently over what it should be now? So it's it's one I think we need to recognize those individual states. And in the case of ours, like the visitors, if we don't go by a DPS delisting, we're all going to be home here a long time, which is totally unfair, I think, to all of us. Dave, if I may, and I and I certainly think that that Jeff hit on part of that, but. I think it's imperative that when you look at that, that you have uh, uh, local and appropriate input on recovery criteria. 
And uh, certainly there is, if, if, if you go back into the grizzly bear and you look at the uh, 2007 delisting rule, you have criteria set forth for uh, a minimum viable population, uh, you have distribution uh, goals set, and then you have uh, uh, a minimum popu population for genetic diversity. And so that was the best available science that was used to calculate what and, and come up with the recovery criteria for the Yellowstone uh, grizzly bear population. In addition to that, uh, there are several sections in the 2007 rule that clearly articulate that, um, for the example, the issue of connectivity with other grizzly bear populations on a historical perspective did not exist. And so if you can combine those, take into account uh, species viability, take into account uh, uh, the fact that industry and, and agriculture need to function and, and uh, where you're at with minimum viable populations and genetic diversity. I think in the Yellowstone grizzly bear um, situation, it, it plays out pretty um, evenly and, and fairly clearly. Dustin, do you have anything you want to add? Uh, no, but we, uh, well, I guess I do a little bit. <laughs> I wasn't going to, but, um, you know, I think what, what uh, both Scott and Jeff has said is, is correct. And, of course, on the on the wolf issue, that was our focus, um, going straight to the, the language of the Act um, regarding uh, whether or not a species is endangered uh, within all or a significant portion of its range. Um, and that was the approach we took with wolves is, you know, we had our regulatory mechanisms in place in Idaho uh, and Montana, and, uh, you know, Wyoming was working uh, through some of their challenges with the service on their uh, regulatory mechanism and their management plan. Um, but we felt confident that the act provided that kind of flexibility to bifurcate that distinct population segment and move forward with uh, delisting and uh, rewarding the states uh, of Idaho and Montana for adhering to those recovery plans and for doing a damn good job over the last 10 years to recover wolves and manage wolves. And so that was the focus that we took and I believe 2009 uh, with the uh, the wolf uh, delisting litigation. Ultimately, again, as I indicated in my remarks, um, Congress came in in uh, 2011 uh, because that 2009 rule was thrown out, Congress came in in 2011 and reinstated that 2009 rule that did bifurcate that distinct population segment. But again, going back to the to the litigation and, and, and our case in Idaho and Montana, we felt very confident that we had that flexibility within the Endangered Species Act to bifurcate that d distinct population segment. Mm -hmm. And I'll, I'll note that we have people on both sides to take questions uh, with microphones if, if you have any questions. We have a question. We can find a question here. So, uh, maybe I can let you finish your thought, I think. And I was wondering if you wanted to say something about the court ruling um, regarding rules. And I'm not sure you had a chance to tell us what you have in mind. And, and I guess the, the, the notes that I had is uh, the court ruling on wolves, and, and uh, I believe it was uh, uh, Representative Summers that started down that road, if, if, and the governor also addressed it as well. If, if you look at the wolf delisting in Wyoming, uh, wolves were, were delisted in Wyoming, the commission set forth a plan, the Wyoming legislature intervened and set forth a bunch of parameters, and we began, and the governor, working with uh, Secretary Salazar came up with an agreement. We began working forward with that, uh, those parameters and managed wolves in Wyoming, I would say, very, very successfully for two years. And, and then that court decision that came in, um, the best available science, all of the science available, said wolves are doing fine in Wyoming. As a matter of fact, we're about 30% above the level that we agreed to manage wolves at. And then the courts came in and said no. Uh, because of this technicality uh, that basically our our wolf management plan was not in law uh, that uh, uh, they threw it out and even though we could prove 
that that plant had successfully managed wolves in Wyoming. Um, we were, we're no longer, the state no longer has management authority over that. And that's part of that process that I was referring to. Okay, I guess my question in the group would be, you know, in light of increasing numbers of uh, species that, that get listed on the Native Species Act, and uh, you brought up the viability issue, I and mean, the Forest Service has a viability policy, species viability policy on sensitive species. What kind of workload do you see this causing the states over time? And are there enough resources available in states just to simply keep up under the way we currently manage, the way the ESA works and sensitive species stuff works? Do we have the manpower to even keep up with this? I guess to answer quite simply from Montana standpoint, I'd say no. Um, Scott talked about the numbers he had. Our legislature this last session asked us the state agency through a budget process, how much do we spend on endangered species? And it's kind of difficult to separate that out totally because it's the same biologist. We didn't hire any biologists specifically to deal with bears or wolves or whatever. We try to use what we had, but we spend somewhere right close to $5 million a year right now out of, again, which is just like Scott said, it's out of our sportsman license dollars. We do use some of our federal Pittman dollar, Pittman Robertson money as well. But we're spending in excess of $5 million a year right now on dealing with endangered species. So to take on even more is, is beyond our capability right now. Albert, I guess I would jump in and say, uh, uh, if you look at uh, our most recent ESA work, and I would point to the sage grouse as that, uh, I think that everyone at this table will say that sage grouse has been the greatest uh, conservation effort, uh, not only in our lifetime, but um, in the history of wildlife management, and I think it's probably even bigger than uh, species restoration when you're looking at, at Pittman Robertson and Dingle Johnson um, in the 20s and, and 30s. So uh, if we have to handle every species like we did sage grouse, absolutely not. Uh, if you look at the state of Wyoming and you look at all of the interests and the individuals and and, and all of the work that was done way beyond Wyoming Game and Fish Department. Look at the effort that industry put into that. Look at the effort that uh, the WWNRT put into that. Look at the effort that the governor's office put into that. Look at the effort that private landowners and the sage grouse uh, implementation teams and the sage grouse working groups put into that, Albert. We have to go through that with, with every species. Uh, we're, we're, we're tremendously underfunded an undermanned uh, to do any of that type of work. Uh, but then I will also say that if you look at, at where we're going with the black footed ferret, uh, and if we can get those regulatory assurances and leeways through the 10J so that we can uh, begin moving forward with black footed ferret conservation with more flexibility, um, yeah, I think we have a chance at, at matching some of those. <coughs> those uh, yeah, I think that, you know all the state agencies are could be understaffed and underfunded with the um, the pattern of of, uh, of, of listings and, and petitions that uh, uh, have been thrown at the at the Fish and Wildlife Service. And uh, you know, I would speak for Director Moore and the, and, and the Department of Fish and Game that um, you know that's the exact same situation that these two gentlemen are in, um, just the, the funding and the uh, and the capacity. Um, However, with the recent changes to the uh, petitioning process of the uh, the Obama administration, um, that's actually a very very positive um, a positive thing to, to really be considering because what that would allow is uh, or require is the coordination uh, with the states, with our agency staff, with our biologists and our experts on any of these petitions, and plus it limits that re new regulation change would limit each petition to one species at a time. So in a way, I think the trend would possibly slow down in terms of uh, um, petitions and listings with these proposed regulation changes uh, coming out of the administration, uh, but also allow for allowing for the states to participate in that process and uh, provide the data and uh, 
you know, determine whether or not these petitions are actually valid, I think that is going to help immensely in terms of, uh, of, of workloads for the Fish and Wildlife Service and the states, and hopefully will help us uh, curb that trend and, uh, and, and slow down the amount of petitions and, uh, and species listings that are, are being thrown at the Fish and Wildlife Service. Maybe drill down a little bit further. Speak specifically to Section Six of the Act, and that's the cooperation piece. Maybe even the cooperating, the cooperating agreements section in that. Um, primarily, the piece that you outlined now is kind of with the grouse was, was more responsive. Talk to me about how that section can be used from a state perspective to be a little bit more um, proactive in envisioning what's coming our way related to listings or potential. Processes for the um, <laughs> uh, Well, I think uh, again, in, in my remarks, the states do need to be playing a dominant role here, and, and um, they're the they're the experts. Um, there's from a listed standpoint, um, you know, Section Six funding is very very minimal. Um, you indicated on grizzly bears, it's been a small amount coming to the states, but the Aside from the funding, the cooperation with the states is is a very very important piece and a very key component of the Endangered Species Act. And I think that's where I would um, that's kind of where I was going with with states involvement. So that part of the act, Section Six, really needs to be um, highlighted. And that's the part of the act where the states could really be involved in jumping in and and playing a dominant role in conservation in recovery. Obviously, we have the federal partners there with us. But, uh, you know, the funding is a, is a big issue. Section 6 funding under a listed scenario is a, is a big issue, and it's oftentimes uh, insufficient. But if we could use Section 6 to try to stay ahead of the curve um, and, and focus on those rare and declining species and those species with greatest conservation need and really make, um, really reprioritize which species we need to focus on and using Section 6, that cooperative piece with Fish and Wildlife Service, I, can, I think we can develop stronger partnerships Fish and Wildlife and with our other conservation partners in the NGO world and in the industry sector um, to prioritize and really try to stay ahead of the curve uh, on, on preventing listings. We did a good job with sage grouse, and, uh, but uh, I think we need to keep going. Jeff, uh, you talked about uh, the rain and the concern with its primary threat being climate change and the issues that creates with the recovery plan. Do you see the ESA, this is open for all three of you, the ESA being equipped to handle concerns about climate change? You know, like I said, I don't think climate change was ever really anticipated or thought of in the 70s when that was passed. So I, I think it is a difficult dilemma. I think the service is required to look at all of what is perceived to be threats to a species. But it does become a question about when you do have species that are doing very well, um, is, it, is it really is it acceptable to look at that threat 30 to 40 years down the road and say, well, the state has to develop a recovery plan for something that we probably don't have any control over. And we don't know, you know, Scott referred to the white bark pine. We don't know what the adaptability might be of wolverines. Um, I understand some studies that have been in Scandinavia, they find that they are starting to do more denning and whatnot there, just under logs and whatnot, like a black bear. So that becomes a question is, is it appropriate to be listening to species based on the threat that may occur in the future? And that was one of our biggest concern was is that the studies that were done that led them to that belief, we thought there were some flaws in it. It really wasn't giving the overall consideration you know, to what that snowpack might be. And, and, you know, part of the discussion that came up at that point is, well, we need to look at translocations of wolverines into the Sierra Nevada or wherever else where there's going to be high elevation snowpack load. But then again, the question is, is, so what is that doing? Is that giving another 50 years? You know, so I, I think it's a real difficult dilemma that needs to be looked at and is it something that should be considered a primary threat? Because in the case of wolverines in particular, um, they have proposed basically to write a 4D rule for virtually everything else, ski development, logging, and everything else, um, which were not considered a significant threat, but the issue of the question, the high elevation snowpack. So I, I've thrown it out there as well. The question is, 
And from my perspective, in my state, a lot of people said, you know, why would we bother with a weird recovery plan if we can't impact what's going to happen anyway? Because of the amount of money and effort that goes into it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, I guess I wouldn't have much to add to that. I think Jeff covered that fairly well, but certainly in discussions with our colleagues from Alaska, and there is a, um, a representative from Alaska here, when you look at the listing of ring seals and polar bears and, and potentially walruses, and you look at uh, sea ice and those types of things, uh, and Jeff's point is well taken, uh, how do we create sea ice? So, uh, as mentioned earlier, there was, someone that there was a few success stories and they were litigated after the fact. And it seems like no matter what the federal agencies do, they're litigated. Um, do you feel that the states are a little less vulnerable to that, or if the states have more control over the management of the species, that litigation would be less likely? Okay. I guess I don't know. You know, it's hard to predict on what a group will sue on based on, but um, the, way, the way we looked at it, that if the states and the service can stand together very clearly about a plan and everybody agrees to it, it's going to have much more weight behind it, as opposed to as if there was a de proposal by the service and the states weren't really bought into that. Um, you know, I mean, it's a question of who, who do you really want to be suing you? Do you want the states to sue you? And in some cases, states are threatened to do that. They're going to sue over listing or delisting. Um, on the flip side, is or, or is it more fear that from whatever the environmental group is just going to sue? So I, I don't know that there's truly an answer to that. You know, and I don't know if it's the right answer, but Dustin referred to the way wolves got delisted in Montana, Idaho, was congressional action, which basically put it in place and took it above the courts that way. I, I don't know that that's the best way to do it, but it was done, and several states have looked at it for that instance with other species out there now. I think we have time for one more question if anybody has uh, any other questions. I don't think it, I don't even mind. Um, so you guys mentioned I heard multiple times uh, the issue of, you know, the state press took a collaborative effort, a lot of work, a lot of effort, a lot of resources. Um, you know, but in, in most of the meetings and forums I've attended, you know, most of the listing NGOs uh, make the claim that if not for their action, uh, nothing would have happened anyway. So I guess I don't expect that train to slow down on their perspective. So what are states doing, or what? I mean, what, what, what do you guys? I'm just like your thoughts on what you guys would propose, because I think those collaborative efforts are going to have to continue if we're going to continue to stay on top of this. Because I don't expect that other side to stop doing what they've been doing in the past. I guess I'd take a quick shot at, at your your statement, or, or my comment would be as, as certainly as states, and if you look at, at other species that we have dealt with, like swift fox, et cetera, um, uh, we take that charge of, of Wyoming state statute that we're responsible for the management of all wildlife uh, very, very seriously. And uh, you know, the, the North American model of, of funding that, that sportsmen fund uh, all conservation. Uh, and there was some con um, comments made earlier about who's going to be responsible for that funding. Is it is it in all of our best interests? Where does that funding come from? I think that's a big question that we have to, to ask ourselves. And, and we as wildlife agencies right now are probably not adequately funded as we got to in a roundabout way. The other question, if, if we go down the sage grouse route, on every species, can we afford to do that? Absolutely not. But um, there, there probably needs to be some recognition that there needs to be some additional capacity built into the system to uh, to handle those other species. And well, that's the, uh, the the value of a collaborative is you're, you're kind of spreading out um, a lot of the work, and um, you know, the collaborative work well in sage grouse from a land use planning standpoint in Idaho. You know, we were involved in drafting an Idaho-specific roadless rule um, back in, help me out, Callie, was that 2000? <laughs> Anyways, um, 
it, it, it was it truly was a solid collaborative that included industry uh conservation partnerships and uh, the right people were in the room they came up with a criteria of addressing uh land use activities within our particular roadless areas and it succeeded it was a zonal approach we had more restrictive practices uh, in one end, conservation actions in one end, and less restrictive conservation actions in another end. And what that allowed us to do was get out from under that one-size-fits-all, top-down Clinton roadless rule and come up with our own grassroots from the ground up strategy, again, to conserve these roadless areas, but provide for the needs of, uh, of the people of our state. And ultimately, that was litigated in uh, district court in Idaho. Uh, in front of a judge that oftentimes is not too friendly towards uh, the states <laughs> for a number of reasons, um, but uh, but the rule was was upheld in uh, in the lower courts. It was appealed to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, which upheld the lower court's decision. So it's the law of the land, and largely because of the collaborative effort that went into building that strategy. Everybody had skin in the game. Uh, much like with greater sagegrass, so many people had skin in the game and made it happen. And so that really is, I think, a, a, a model for future conservation initiatives. That's the way to get things done, to have everybody in the room, um, to have skin in the game, the right people. And uh, that's truly how you're going to succeed on a lot of these wildlife conservation initiatives that balance conservation with the econ economic vitality of our state. So um, those are expensive. The sagegrass thing is very expensive but you know i think you can uh, share some of those responsibilities oftentimes in a larger group setting so i think it's important too that i don't know if the states do the best job they can but the reason we have species on the ground today and we've had these recovery efforts is largely state management efforts i don't know if we've done that great a job with the courts in a lot of cases because of other people will bring in but we have the managers on the ground and we're the ones that can show that what we have out there, and we, we are going to have to want to show that we can manage those species. But I think we can do that, and I think we just need to continue to collaborate and continue to do that to show that you know when somebody brings in a lawsuit or whatever else is that we are managing these species. The reason they're there now, and the habitat is there now, is because of the managers that have been there for many years and our continuation to do that. Well, in order to stay on schedule, I think we're we're out of time. Uh